evening and welcome to our Monday Thursday worship service. And we begin. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. And we begin by singing, O oh Jesus, I have promised. Israel. 
remembered its deliverance from slavery in Egypt by celebrating the festival of Passover. This festival featured the Passover lamb whose blood was used as a sign to protect God's people from the threat of death. The early church described the Lord's Supper using imaginary from the Passover, especially in portraying Jesus as the lamb who delivers God's people from sin and death. First reading is Exodus 12, verses 1 through 4 and 11 through 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take the lamb for each family, a lamb for, for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor and obtain one. Obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. This is how you shall eat it, your loins bearded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn of the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals, on all of gods of Egypt, and will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the house where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be the day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance, word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. In the bread and cup of the Lord's Supper, we experience intimate fellowship with Christ and with one another because it involves a body given for us and the new covenant of his blood. Faithful particip participation in this meal is a living pro pro proclamation of Christ's death until he comes in the future. Second reading, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23-26. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and we had given thanks. He broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in the, my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The story of the Last Supper in John's Gospel recalls a remarkable event not mentioned elsewhere. Jesus performs the duty of a slave, washing the feet of his disciples and urging them to do the same for one another. The Holy Gospel according to John, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, before the, the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, 
but it's entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, you know what I have done to you. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should also should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so I now say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love, if you have love for one another. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Well, grace and peace to you in the name of our merciful Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I was visiting with a friend of mine, a colleague, uh, another pastor, um, here a while back, and she mentioned that uh, something really struck her, a, a, a book that she was reading, and uh, this was what the author had said. Self-preservation is the first law of physical life. Self-sacrifice is the first law of spiritual life. Self-preservation is the first law of physical life. Self-sacrifice is the first law of spiritual life. Now, of course, we know that self-preservation is simply taking care of yourself. It's making sure your needs are met. It's catering to our human needs in order to stay alive. I remember learning in a high school psychology class about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Do you remember learning that in one of your psychology classes? Remember that pyramid? It was Abraham Maslow, a well-known psychologist who developed this theory way back in 1943. It was five levels of self-preservation, and you couldn't meet the next level until you had made that, or made the level before it. So it, it went up this way. The first level was uh, human survival, very simple. Physi physiological needs. We need air, we need to be able to breathe, we need water, we need food, we need sleep. We need clothing, we need shelter. The very basic human physical needs. The second one is safety and security needs. Personal security, financial security, health and well-being. Safety needs against accidents and illness and their adverse effects. Kind of what we're going through right now. And the third one is social belonging relationships with others, family, friends, love relationships, communication with others, support systems, being a part of a community, feeling loved by others. I think because we're suffering through number two with, these, uh, with the virus, we're also kind of suffering with number three in our relationships with others, or lack of it right now because of the uh, social distancing. The fourth one is esteem needs, our ego, um, concern for getting recognition and respect from others. 
This might be getting a promotion at work and the good feeling we get because of that. Or maybe just getting a simple compliment from someone. Or maybe getting a bunch of likes on Facebook. That's probably where we would put that, that category. And then the fifth one, a little bit harder to achieve, is self-actualization. Now that's, um, that's when a person reaches their full potential and uh, reaches what their, really their purpose in life is. They have a good feeling of why they are in this life and what they are doing. They have a sense of purpose. Now these are all self-preservation uh, tactics. And, and we as humans need all of these. But it wasn't until many, many years later that Maslow added one that he decided we really needed. And that one he called self-transcendence. This is our spiritual life. This is the realization that we need a higher power. This is a realization that there is something bigger than ourselves that we really need. He equated this with the desire to reach the infinite, seeking God and godly experiences, seeking the kingdom of God. And the main thing of this, he said, the main point he, he talked about in this was that in this step, we go from having concern only for, for oneself to caring about others. We go from self-preservation to self-sacrifice in the spiritual realm. So we go right back to what my friend had said um, in this book that she read. Self-preservation is the first law of physical life. Self-sacrifice is the first law of spiritual life. Self-sacrifice. Jesus chose the path of self-sacrifice completely over self-preservation. And this is what Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Easter, and being a Christian is all about. Jesus is the epitome, the personification, the embodiment of self-sacrifice. Jesus Christ was given to us to die for us. And truly, that is a love that in my own humanness, I can't even begin to understand. And yet it is that grace, that love, that ultimate sacrifice that compels us as Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ, to become self-sacrificing as well. To not live into the human law of self-preservation, but to live into the spiritual law of self-sacrifice. It's where we find the kingdom of God. What does that look like right now? Especially during this pandemic? Well, it's people taking care of one another. It's the health care providers risking their own health and, and their own lives to take care of the sick. It's the, the grocery store worker or the uh, post office worker or the person working in a bank or a pharmacy or driving a truck somewhere who is out there caring for and providing for all of our basic needs. It's people like you and me who simply stay at home when we don't have to be out to protect those who are more vulnerable to this deadly disease. That's what the kingdom of God looks like right now. Even if it means that we can't gather together on Easter as, as one big uh, gathering of our church. Right now, this is what the kingdom of God looks like. Make no mistake about that. Jesus 
chose the path of self-sacrifice over self-preservation. And yes, we are called to do the same. To love one another as Christ loved us. So, on this night, this most sacred and holy night, we pause. We pause and we hear once more Jesus' commandment, his mandate. That's what mandate means, is commandment, mandate. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Four times in that, Jesus says the word love. It's not always easy, and we often fail. It's our human nature to be self-preserving and not self-sacrificing. That self-sacrificing. But Jesus knew that. God knows that. And so, we try, and then we mess up, and then we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have not loved God with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We often fail. But in the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ is given to die for us and for his sake. God forgives us all of our sins. There is no greater love. Thanks be to God. Amen. At this time, let us turn our hearts and our minds to the prayers of the people. United with Christians around the globe, on this Maundy Thursday, we pray for the church, the earth, our troubled world, and all in need. Responding to each petition with your words, your mercy is great. God of love, unite your church in its commitment to humble service. Make us your faithful disciples. Speak words of truth and grace through us. Encourage us in self-giving acts of kindness. Let us love one another as you have loved us. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of love, tend to plots, fields, and vineyards. Bring favorable weather for crops to grow. Guide the hands of those who cultivate farm and garden. Let the earth flourish so that all may eat and be satisfied. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of love, you gave us a new commandment to have love for one another. We give thanks for organizations that respond to disasters and for agencies that offer relief and humanitarian aid to populations in need. We especially are grateful for all those working and responding to the COVID-19 crisis. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. God of love, give ear to all who call upon you for any need of body or spirit. Provide for those who do not have enough to eat, those who are unemployed or underemployed, and those who rely on the generosity of others. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. God of love, glorify your servants who walk by faith in this life and who now feast with you. Inspire us by the sacrifice of those who were imprisoned, persecuted, or martyred for their faith. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. According to your steadfast love, O oh God, Hear these and all our prayers as we commend them to you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And we now sing our, our sending song.
Were you there when they crucified my Lord? First three verses. 